Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so th uh, this bit of the, the Dynamo conference is the story of how Pete met Faye, which kind of um, sounds like this is where everyone goes, hang on, am I in the right place here? Um, but I've been looking forward to this one because this I get asked this all the time. It's probably one of my most frequently asked questions is uh, from businesses in the areas, how can I do more business with public sector? And it kind of makes sense because public sector spends quite a lot. I mean, Faye, I'm not sure how much you're going to go into the numbers, but your place has a sort of roughly a billion pound a year IT budget. So that goes quite a long way. And government are actually quite good payers as well. So it, it sort of makes sense that our local tech startups want to do more business with government. But, uh, you know, as ever, it's difficult for small players to do business with huge organizations so it's just absolutely brilliant when we get ambitious local businesses like word nerds doing business with dwp on the patch here and that's why we really wanted to make sure we had this in the conference to share the story so um so i'm gonna shut up um, i said before that just for anyone that's just joined us if you would like to say hi in the chat then lovely to hear from who's here because the speakers can't actually see who's here um, if you don't want to say hi, that's also fine. Um, PC and Faye have said that they'd like to take questions during if it's appropriate. So um, please feel free to chip in questions. I might pop up and ask uh, or not, depending on how we go. And if you would like to see the slides, I think everyone knows this now, but double click on the slides to make those two. Or if you'd like to admire Pete's lockdown beard, then equally you can just double click on Pete and not bother with the slides. So it's really up to you. Um, so uh, on that note, am I handing over to, I think it's Faye first, isn't it? Well, I think Pete's going to go first. Oh, it's Pete's going to go first. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't check. Right, over to you both in that case. Well, we were just going to introduce ourselves. So uh, Faye, ladies first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Faye Cooper. I'm product lead at DWP, and my focus is on child maintenance. Uh, and my name is Pete Dagan. I am CEO of WordNerds. We're a deep tech startup based in Gateshead's Proto. We're VC backed by some amazing Northeast entrepreneurs and those lovely people at North Star Ventures. So hire everybody. Uh, Recognising some friendly faces and some some good names in the chat by the side. So hi. Um, very quickly, um, I think Andrew's actually covered some of this. The uh, the Northeast is as all of you will know, predominantly made up of small businesses, SMEs, um, individuals, micro businesses. We do have um, some amazing larger organizations, people like the DWP. Um, but collaboration between the two has uh, historically been sketchy at best. Um, so one of the reasons we're here is because uh, in, in the work between DWP and Word Nerds, uh, we found a really interesting um, rhythm of working together and uh, and ways that small, disruptive, fast-moving, agile businesses uh, can kind of seamlessly fit into some of the, you know, what have been historically regarded as archaic institutions that actually these days are modernizing rapidly and uh, are well able to take advantage of more, more agile, um, disruptive. Uh, so partly we wanted to kind of share that. And I think the second thing, um, the second thing really is because um, a lot of idiots like me turn up to these things and tell everybody how fantastic our tech is. Um, and we kind of show you some of our technology and we'll sort of say anything about it. And you have no idea whether or not it's true. Um, actually, Faye's going to do nearly all of the talking in this, which is probably a relief to all of you. Um, and the reason for that is actually she can tell you not just um, how DWP are using some really cutting edge artificial intelligence, um, some very old school linguistics to, to understand their voice of customer better, but also actually crucially what that means for their business, what that means for the things that they can do, uh, the different things that they can um, that they can implement because of it, and the results that they've had um, as a result of some of these these bits and pieces that we, we labor over. So there you go. That's the top line. Faye, are you ready for this? Thank you, Pete. Yeah, let's go. Okay, so we're going to talk about the child maintenance service today. And the child maintenance service enables £1 billion to be paid to over 1 million children every year. So the key focus of our service is on the flow of money between two separated parents and the child um, that belongs to them. 
So the big mission for us as a kind of overarching statement is it's all about the children. So we do work to get an arrangement in place between the parents. We want to get money to the child. That, that's absolutely the bottom line for us. We want to do it as quick as possible. So when a relationship breaks down, the first thing we know is that the money and the flow of money can just stop immediately. And that can have huge implications for single parents who then suddenly can't feed their children, can't close their children in. And it can be quite a dramatic change. We also um, know that people need to feel secure when they come to our service and they need peace of mind. So a big um, thing we know about people when they break down in a relationship is that they often feel that coming through a child maintenance service might make things worse, might rock the boat. So it's just making sure that whatever we do doesn't make things worse. So access to the child maintenance service, we've got um, a bar there at the bottom of the screen. That's our high level um, user journey. So it covers things like signposting, when people break down, how do they get into our service? How do they orientate to our product? We then have an eligibility phase. So people talk at the moment to an advisor who will find out things about the relationship breakdown, how fragile it is, and whether or not the service is right for them. So wherever possible, we do encourage people to work together. We know that long term, that has a better outcome for the child if the parents can work together. If they can't, then they come through the application service. So this is the focus of today, really, to talk about our apply service. Um, once they've applied and they have an arrangement in place, we then have an online account. And if people still don't comply um, through the online account, we can't take legal and enforcement action. So there's lots of bits to the service, but as I say, the bit we're going to talk about today is the application. So when I joined um, the child maintenance service, 100% of users were coming through a telephony journey. So that was great in terms of support. So we had really great caseworkers who would talk to talk to a, um, a separated parent and, and they would take about 45 minutes to do that. The feedback we had initially was that parents found that really restrictive. So there's two points to that. Sometimes people don't like to talk to someone. It's a very personal thing. And also they don't, um, they want to do it at a time that's convenient for them. And obviously the telephony journey was restricted to certain times of the day. So we also knew that people were very vulnerable. So people were declaring domestic abuse when they came through the service. So we had to find a way of reviewing the whole service as an application and how could we cope with them very vulnerable people coming through. And we also had a business problem that the online account, although it had a high sign up rate, it had a very, very low um, usage rate. So about 30% of people actually went on to use their account, which was, wasn't brilliant, wasn't really delivering the results we needed. So one of our biggest problems um, across WP is we're very human centered. We want to understand the voice of the customer and our issue is that we can't always get to the customer and understand um, at any kind of scale what's really going on. And I think with a, a service like child maintenance, you're dealing with every kind of um, person, very broad demographic range of people. So we did do things like annual surveys. We did do um, user research. So we have two full-time user researchers across child maintenance. And they would speak to people on a sort of two week sprint cycle. We might do a focus piece of work on one thing we want to find out. And that might result in about 10 interviews happening. So it was very rich and deep data, but it wasn't um, anything at a scale that, that would make you really understand it was representative. And we would speak to customers and we would do call listening. We would record calls and, and you know, kind of review what that was telling us. But for us, it just felt very bitty. It didn't feel like enough. So when you're reviewing um, a digital product and creating a new one, as we were, we needed to really think about how to get this scale into the equation. So one of the other problems we had apart from scale was that we had stakeholders who'd worked in child maintenance for, you know, sort of 15 years plus. So very senior stakeholders who felt they understood the service, that they understood what our users need. So we wanted to really think about how we could use data to bring them forward in their thinking. 
So a lot of the conversations I've had very early on with the stakeholders were, you know, I think this or I feel this about would be best for us. And I wanted to get to a point where we had hard facts so we could say, well, actually the data shows us something different or a trend that maybe we hadn't considered before. So the product team had a number of hypotheses that they were testing and two of the biggest ones were around people being very vulnerable. So um, very, very nervous to use a digital service because of their vulnerability. The, the situation when they broke down, it's very fractious, so they were trying to find ways to appease that. And also that the domestic abuse rates were quite high. So our stakeholders had some data that showed it was about 20, 30% max. We believe from call listening, it was definitely nearer 50%, but we had no evidence to back any of this up. So they were kind of the problems I was grappling with at around the time I met Pete Dakin. Okay. And uh, I, I think the uh, it's just worth saying how, how we met. Do you want to do you want to tell the story of how we met? <laughs> yeah. So uh, when uh, so DWP rarely does this. Andrew and I were laughing about this earlier. We rarely sponsor events. So we sponsored a startup competition, um, which was part of the Thinking Digital Conference. So I was invited along to be a guest judge. And when I turned up, there were a number of startups. Um, pitching their different ideas and Pete kind of took to the floor to pitch his idea and after every presentation we were expected as a judge to give feedback so you know it was kind of you know interesting but what about this or have you thought about you know scalability or, or how are you going to take this to the market when Pete kind of did his presentation I was a little bit blown away by what he was saying and it suddenly dawned on me that what we needed was exactly the thing that he was talking about so I very awkwardly did I not Pete say yeah, I think we need we need to use this product. Pete. It wasn't so much a question as so much of a gushing statement. At which point, Pete just starts laughing, and I felt the the whole eyes of everyone in the room because I was in the front row, burning on the back of my neck because I felt like I just the, the show was over from that point, wasn't it, Pete? Brilliant! It was the single greatest competition judge moment in the world. You will never be invited onto Britain's Got Talent or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For a judge to say in the questions, but oh my god, we totally need that. Can we get that? Uh, was me and uh, hilarious. So there you go. Never get Faye as a judge, people. Um, yeah, uh, so we met Faye completely randomly at one of these amazing Northeast tech community events. Um, and very quickly, just to give you a bit of a background into what ner word nerds do and why that's kind of interesting and different. Um, the problem that we solve is that big brands, big organizations, uh, large companies, institutions like DWP, they all suffer from the problem of too many words, whether that's um, social media, whether it's uh, customer information through CRM systems, through help desk, online chat, emails, online reviews, news and forums, uh, or even internal survey data. All of these large organizations have millions and millions and millions of data points of unstructured text that is written about and by their organization. And that's all amazing data that they could use to get an insight that can drive action and, uh, and, and sort of build business cases for taking decisions. Uh, the problem though is language is pretty weird. Young people use it very differently from older people. Um, up here in the Northeast, we have a completely different vocabulary and a largely different vernacular to everywhere else in the country. Get into social media, people shorten language. Uh, literally everybody in the UK is hugely sarcastic and often writes the exact opposite of what they mean. And don't even start us on spelling, grammar, punctuation, all of that good stuff. Words are bonkers. And the problem with words is the same word can mean something completely different in two different scenarios. So take the word outstanding. Uh, anybody who's ever used online sentiment analysis will know that outstanding is a hugely positive word. And most of the time it is, except in the context of, on, of outstanding debt. Outstanding debt is the worst possible type of debt you can have. And we all hate it. And it sucks. Um, similarly, the word sick. None of us want to be sick during COVID. But, you know, I'm speaking to my 12 year old daughter and everything she owns is sick and nothing I own is sick. And it means something completely different. Um, so words are weird, right? Sharp is great in a suit, less good in a baby toy. And 
historically, the way that uh, we've used to make, to make sense of, of words at, at any kind of scale um, hasn't been very good. Um, most of the software that's available on the market today uses things like word clouds. Word clouds are the single most useless thing human beings have ever invented. Um, they basically count words. They tell you the frequency of, uh, of words that are being used in a particular data set. Um, and depending on the frequency, they make those words bigger or smaller. It's very, very interesting stuff. Um, likewise, sentiment analysis, giving something a sentiment score as a, uh, as a big piece of text doesn't tell you anything because language is nuanced. You might say, I really love this product, but I'm having problems with the login. Um, I really like the results that this has given me, but the visuals on it stink. Um, they're completely different constructs within one idea, and just understanding that the a score relating to the totality of something doesn't give anybody any actionable insight. So what are we doing differently at WordNerds? Uh, let me see if I can start this video. So we've invented a, a, context, a context engine that uses AI and old school linguistics to teach computers to read and genuinely understand the meaning behind language. So the idea is you can type in an example of the kind of thing that you want, um, and based on its understanding of wider language, the AI will come back and find other things in the data um, that mean the same thing, even if you use different words. So here, in the example I've just shown you there, um, we put in the example of somebody saying, my internet connection isn't very good, uh, and it pulls out things like, my Wi-Fi sucks. And based on the stuff that comes out, uh, any idiot, uh, even people as stupid as me, people without any understanding really of how data science works, um, can go in and train their own AI based on the information that they care about and the context that makes sense to them. Uh, and it allows you to get a massive data set, pull out only the bits that you care about or the bits that are relevant to you at that time, uh, and then in a more effective and efficient way, do all of the topic analysis and sentiment analysis and you know, count a bit of how many people have got a particular problem, but in a much smarter way. So what does that mean? So what? So that means that people like Faye can, on the one hand, have real-time alerts. They can be told about things that they care about when they care about them. That can be specific issues that are happening, specific things that people are saying around their service delivery, um, or it can be more general stuff. So when volume goes up and sentiment goes down around a particular area, they can be nudged to go back to the platform and see what's happening because it often is indicative of an issue. Um, but it can also allow us to, uh, in a more strategic way, look back at a data set and say, right, okay, over the last month, over the last year, you know, in a given period, what is it that your users are talking about? What things are they saying um, that they're having problems with? What things do they like? What don't they understand? What questions have they got? You know, what are they talking about and how do they feel about them? And we can do it in isolation. We can do it just with your stuff. Or we can take other data sets, public and open, um, and we can, we can benchmark people against their competitors. So it turns out train companies have a bunch of people moaning about trains being late. That's normal. But does LNER have more of a problem than go via Thames Link? Does TransPennine uh, have a bigger issue with toilets on their trains than, spoiler alert, LNER are really good. So there you go. That's what word nerds do. Back over to Faye to show you how DWP have basically taken the ability to do that with text and embed it in their day-to-day -day product discovery. Yeah, so the first thing that um, Pete and I did with WordNerds was to set up a proof of concept. So I think, you know, as much for WordNerds as for us, it was to understand all of the key words around child maintenance. And we defined about six of those search terms, what were people saying about our service? And we did that over a few, um, well, it was about eight weeks, I think, Pete, wasn't it, over a summer period, and then got back with their report. So the report for me was amazing and really showed the power of the tool. So we, like I say, had had the hypothesis that people came into our service very stressed. The, the biggest sentiment, and without doubt, the, the most negative sentiment really around child maintenance was stress and anxiety. So suddenly our stakeholders who hadn't necessarily had much experience with user research, when in the past we'd shown them sort of 10, 15 examples of conversations, hadn't felt very comfortable to make big decisions. Suddenly we were showing them sentiment over about two, 300,000 tweets. 
suddenly they sat up and listened and they said, okay, um, you're right. The, the, the tweets, the, the evidence was there to really show that we had to address that in the product to make the product successful. Can you move it on, Pete? Yeah, there we go. So what did we do? So for us, um, Pete and I often talk about if you've got loads of data, but you do nothing with it, it's a bit of pants, really. It's not It's not really um, useful. We did a lot with the data. So we knew that people were not comfortable um, when they arrived with us. So our start page, we started changing a lot of messaging around um, content to put them at ease. Things like, we're not going to share your information with the other partner. We're not going to share your, um, well, anything, basically. No information, no location, no phone number. Um, we're not going to do anything to make your situation worse. We also talked around um, domestic abuse was a big thing for us. So in tandem to the work that we've done with WordNerds, we'd obviously done a lot of discovery work and prep for an alpha build of a new digital service. And in that, we knew, we started asking the question to everybody who rang up, you know, are you a victim of domestic abuse? And the stats showed it was around 50%, which was our, our kind of gut feel and our hypothesis. So we then really had to work hard on the screens for domestic abuse. So we did go through about six iterations and our UX designer was just ready to, I think, walk out. We even had a full cross DWP digital group um, sort of peer peer design session because getting this right in a digital service was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. We we tried, you know, the, the, the direct question, have you suffered from domestic abuse and usability testing? It, it just crashed and burned. Who, who feels comfortable with that when they're faced with it? Um, so we got to a point where the reason we asked the question in our service is around their eligibility to um, pay a fee. So if you're a victim of domestic abuse, we don't charge you a £20 fee. So we started to frame the question in that way so that people understood why we were asking. We then um, made sure that they understood once they'd answered that question, nothing was going to happen as a result. So the next question um, that we asked around domestic abuse was around, um, have you reported it to anyone? Well, can you imagine in a digital service, if, if you have reported it, you don't want to be reminded of it. If you haven't reported it, you think, crikey, what's going to happen? This is the government. This is going to trigger some alert to the police or a, a higher authority. So all of the things that we knew from the tweets and the stress and anxiety, we were like exacerbating in a digital service. So getting this design right was really hard. And we managed to talk to our policy team around why are we asking the reporting types of questions? And they did allow us to relax a lot of that um, policy. So we made really fundamental changes as a result of the data and created a digital service, which went live around, it was November time we started to let people in as a private beta. And then COVID happened. So yeah, and it was really our apply service was just picking up speed. We started, you know, with any new digital service, we would let in around a hundred people a week. We start to ramp up gently, start to find, you know, test and learn. Every sprint was, was bug fixing and, journey fixing and then suddenly we had this huge crisis and our operational team got slashed by a, well to a third so we went from 6,000 staff to 2,000 pretty much um, overnight um, so and then it rapidly reduced to a thousand so firstly it was slashed because teams were redeployed to other benefit lines like universal credit then we had a really high sickness rate where people didn't feel able to come into work because of you know a range of reasons either they were um, not feeling very well because of COVID or stressed themselves so we decided we had to design a minimum um, legal service and as part of that we made some radical changes we shut down um, the telephony route for anybody except those who had assisted digital needs anyone who um, had basically one of five key changes if you didn't have those you weren't allowed to speak to someone so yeah, really radical um, and, and not comfortable for anyone really. And put a lot of pressure on our brand new digital service. So what we kind of found from WordNerds is that we started to track during this period really quickly what the effects of our of changes were on the service. So we didn't use, you know, we didn't put into the engine uh, the, the changes that we'd made. We just started to listen to what people were saying. And, you know, unsurprisingly, the changes that we made were the things they were talking about. So people were talking around um, missed payments. So 
what we found is that there was a huge spike and by far the, the worst sentiment and the biggest volume were around um, parents who just stopped paying their maintenance altogether. Uh, people were complaining that we weren't reassessing the calculation or the income. So if they'd been furloughed, we weren't actually reducing their child maintenance um, payments. We were only reducing it if they breached the threshold of 25%. So there was a lot of talk around that. There was a lot of um, poor sentiment, negative sentiment around contacting us. So because we'd been so brutal in terms of shutting down the service for, like I say, all but a few handful of cases, there was no way people could call us. They could only go online and use their online account to report change or apply online if they were a new customer. And then the biggest thing for me, and obviously the thing that we cared most about strategically was the poverty aspect. So we knew that the changes we had had, people were actually tweeting about how am I supposed to feed my child? How is this going to help me? You know, when are you going to pick up um, and some, give us some support? So really powerful, again, insight for us and things that we shared with our stakeholders. We produced lots of reports and things we could really um, put into action. So some of the things that we started to focus on were around a recovery plan. So this minimum legal service that is currently in place, we know will be lifted soon. So we started to see staff come back from universal credit. We started to see staff return from sickness and we're getting to a kind of a bit of a better place. Once we're put fully back to a, you know, a reasonable staffing level, we've got to start fixing the problems that we've caused. So the big thing for us will be around chasing missed payments because you know the insight is definitely showing us that's without doubt the biggest problem. So we've got things like proactive notifications now going out to customers by SMS. We're also looking at faster payment methods. So rather than speak to us, which you know, let's face it, could be a bit of an awkward conversation if you haven't paid for three or four months. Um, could you just have a link that you then follow and make a payment? So we're looking at discrete ways for people to settle their arrears. And we're also working more with our HMRC data. So we've always had a feed in place with HMRC and that's where we double check income and we just make sure that the information we have is correct. But now could we actually pull that more proactively so that we could be notified of a change and then we can change income and we can change payments where necessary. So there was a lot of immediate changes that we could put in place based on the data. And then, yeah. The big, the big thing is what did we learn? So we learned a lot um, during this time. And as I say, there was a lot of COVID related stuff, um, a lot of stuff just around our users in general, but then we start to get to a kind of a bigger picture place. So what are we gonna do for the future service? And I think like everyone, because of COVID, we don't expect to roll back to the place we were before. So we certainly aren't expecting that when the minimum um, legal service is lifted, that we'll look exactly the way we did before that point. So some of the results, so as I say, our brand new apply service just before COVID, whilst it was just in private beta, we were pretty much filtering through 100% of eligible people and we had a massive um, take up. So it was phenomenal and it, it blew everyone away. So all of the concerns that we'd had around shutting down a telephony application route were completely unfounded. So we managed to move from 100% telephony to 80% digital and that was really just about a few weeks before COVID and then during the COVID period so that's been really radical and we are still offering an assisted digital route so if somebody can't use our digital service they can speak to someone and still apply but we've also um, reduced the time it takes to apply so before it was 45 minutes it's now down to an average of just 17 and you know and again that's an average some people go much faster some people are longer that includes setting up payments and, and lots of more complicated parts of the journey so i think you know that's a brilliant outcome we've also seen loads of people using our online account so about 90 percent take up of the online account and sign up which you know again phenomenal from the base we were and the biggest win for me i have to be honest because we always talk about designing for our most vulnerable users was around saying that 51% of the people who use our service are declaring domestic abuse, showing how vulnerable they are, but also the big win for us, how safe they feel using the digital service. You know, they put a lot of trust in us. They're giving us a lot of information, which puts them in a very vulnerable place. So the fact that they have that trust in the service has been a massive thing for us. 
So yeah, really outstanding results for Apply. And then we're starting to look at the future. So what's the next big thing for us? So one of the big things that WordNerds are going to help us do is to reach what we call the hidden voices. So again, because of our user research and intensive, intensive nature, we can't speak to everyone. And the big area of interest between digital policy at the moment is around the male perspective. So we've done a lot of work around and we're definitely hearing some user research on the male voice saying, I can't afford child maintenance. So that's the reason I don't pay, not because I don't want to. Actually, my behavior is an affordability one, not a, not a choice. So again, a huge amount of work is ongoing at the moment. And the platform is showing us that um, men are feeling very vulnerable at the moment. And that stress and anxiety is there. But there's lots of themes um, that are really helping us think through how we cater better for a male perspective through the service. We're also looking at how we get money to children faster. So again, the insight showing us that people just want to come into our service and get through. So how can we speed up the journey? And this um, on the side, um, left-hand side, is a bit of a snapshot from our high-level service map. So as I said before, we do have this kind of eligibility stage where they have to speak to someone and we're looking at now, well, do they have to speak to someone or could we just filter them straight through? So they're, they're debates that are up for grabs at the moment. We're also looking at our online account. So we're doing a lot of automation. So particularly, how do we remove, avo remove avoidable contacts so that people have everything they need that can get through the service. But if someone reports a change to us, we want to just put that change into effect as quickly as possible. So the automation will really help um, keep cases as strong as they can be. And then we're looking at our channel strategy. So again, the feedback before was definitely around users you know, need ways to contact us. And that might be not necessarily a telephony route. We could fulfill that through a live chat and that would help us with our caseworkers maybe working off site. And we're also looking at automated telephony journeys. And we've been, you know, looking at different pilots for that at the moment. So there's lots going on in terms of channel. And for us, it's thinking about optimizing the channel. So we want users to pick the channel that's right for them. We certainly don't plan to shut any channels off. And then the big thing for the future is to really focus efforts. If we can um, improve automation, if we can reduce telephony on the kind of mundane general questions, then caseworkers can really focus on enforcement action. So dealing with the most vulnerable people and getting money flowing, and that will have the biggest impact in, in the reduction on child poverty, which is the, the kind of end goal for us. And then the final bit, I think, so in conclusion, for us, Word Nerds is part of a kind of a suite of things that we do. So in terms of insight, Word Nerds gives us really rich, up-to-date, real-time user insight. We also get management information, which we assess. We have our user research, which, you know, coupled with Word Nerds is powerful. We can direct our user researchers in a certain way based on the, the voice on Word Nerds, but vice versa. So we could pick something up in our user research and think, hmm, that's interesting. What are people saying about that? And apply it to word nerds as a search term and start to gather more insight. And we also have our statistical analysis. So understanding, you know, typically, sadly, when, when do people's relationships break down? It tends to be January, um, a depressing statistic just after Christmas, or September, just after your annual summer holiday. So we're thinking COVID feels like a bit of an amalgamation of all of these scenarios. So what does the future look like for us? So bringing all of that data together to action and change is the biggest um, end goal. And we know that that data can help us change policy and completely reform the service. And that to me is the most exciting thing um, that we're ever going to achieve. And that's it. So wow. what a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much to both of you. I'm absolutely blown away by those stats about the uptake of the service, Faye. And you know, it really shows what you can do with something like that. And I think as um, as Zoe said in the chat, it's a really sensitive service as well. So to actually do, sort of innovate around something so sensitive is really impressive. And we do have a few questions have popped up. And I was going to invite if anyone else would like to ask questions, then please, please do feel free. I was going to start with James, actually, who was saying, Faye, did you look at using this for looking at individual user problems as well as the, the kind of overview analysis? 
Yeah, so um, I think we're playing around with it, to be honest, James, still. I think that's fair to say, Pete, isn't it? We've tried a few different search terms. Um, we've tried, like I say, looking for things like child maintenance service. We've looked for um, service terms, but we've also stopped to look for things like dead deep dad or, um, you know, things around particular male voices. So we have started to look at specific scenarios about people aren't paying, why. Um, so, yeah, we are, we are using that. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things I would add to that. I think um, it's early days for us. We've only been working together for a few months. And so far, everything we've done, we've been using the Word Nerds platform reactively. So it's all looking at historical data after the event to find, um, find themes in the data. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't actually use it proactively, use it in real time to, um, you know, we could train some models to find different types of users that we're interested in. So it would literally do that triage piece that you're you're talking about, James. I think the other thing is there's, there's two different things here. There's the um, there's the known unknown. So, that, so phase stuff around kind of, we've got a hypothesis that a lot of people are anxious, a lot of people are stressed, but we have no evidence to back that up. Can we go in and proactively find that information in the data set? Um, turns out we could, uh, and we've got some really great results. Um, and we've been so far using it for, for those known unknowns. I think the other interesting thing is the unknown unknowns. The, the AI itself will pick out topics in the data um, that are becoming more or less prevalent depending on what you're looking for. And it will surface some of the concerns that people have, some of the issues that they have, without you necessarily knowing that they're there. Um, and I think as we, as our relationship deepens and as we, you know, work closer and closer together, I think more of those unknown unknowns will be able to be surfaced in real time and brought to the attention of uh, of the team at DWP so that they can do something with that. And I think that's very much along the kind of triaging line that you're you're kind of talking about as well. Yeah, and I think um, Pete, one of the points of a big unknown area for us was, like I say, the male voice because. There's only, um, I think it's three percent on average, um, men who apply to use our service. It, it is really female um, and dominate, dominated. So the thing that we were surprised at, so there's been a lot in terms of tweets with the male voice saying things like, for example, how does this work if I if I want access to my child? And I would have access four nights a week or three nights, but that access is restricted. Therefore, my child maintenance payment's higher, but I can't afford that higher payment. So there are specific scenarios that I suppose we haven't thought through. We wouldn't necessarily come to as a product team that we're now thinking, OK, well, that's an interesting one. Yeah. How do we cater for that sort of thing? How can we support them? So we are definitely starting to I think get into that space of the unknowns. And what does that mean? And how can we use that? And um, there's a, a question from uh, here from Lisa Payne. Hi, Lisa, um, which who was asking something a bit along the lines of what I was thinking as well, which is where if you can prove something like this in what's quite a sort of uh, self-contained part of DWP to a certain extent, then how can you start? So what I was going to ask was how you can start raising awareness around the rest of the DWP empire about what, the power of this and what you could do with this. And I think that's that's kind of the flip side of Lisa's question, which is, well, that's interesting. How could I use that on my service? But yeah. how have you found that, Faye? Because it's quite a big... And a lot of people don't realise how big and complicated that is in terms of the organisational setup. So have you managed to make any progress on that yet? Yeah, so one of the things that I have been doing is working with our head of user-centred design. So he has just started to kind of get his head around what this is and what we're doing with it. I think for Pete and I, the big thing we wanted to do was get to a point where we could really prove its value. And then it seems like a much better proposition to roll it out. So actually the contract we have, and hi Lisa, because Lisa is, is within my directorate, so Lisa would be able to access this, and we did set the contract up. So that's certainly within our directorate, that could be wide, widely used. And then again, it's just rolling out, but there's definitely a lot of interest because I think human-centered design and getting it right for users proves you know the point if you can achieve that we know that it affects take up we know it affects the success of the product so for us it, it has been a fairly easy sell to be honest andrew but at the moment we're just going treaded a bit carefully to get to that point of proving the value yeah that makes sense and um, do feel free to chip in with any questions anyone in the chat i've noticed there's quite a few um product people who are here so i was wondering it's another question for Faye, but i i um, was thinking 
you know, I guess some of the sort of product manager kind of set up in the kind of environment you're working in is quite focused on building stuff and kind of setting out a roadmap where it's all in your control. So I was going to ask what it's like working with a supplier like Word Nerds on this and how you've been able to sort of morph some of the ways of working into that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's been really exciting. So we've had loads of support from WordNerds um, from day one. So it's, you know, been great for us because WordNerds are a startup. So I think it's fair to say, Pete, that everyone's been learning from each other. So I think Pete was a little bit shocked, it's fair to say, about some of the work that we do, because I think everyone has concept, like preconceptions about what government and product work is like. And I think Pete was like, wow, OK, you do that. You think like that. And vice versa, we've learned a lot from them. So for me, it's kind of woven in really well and our product team are really excited. So our user researchers are now involved. Um, our, some of our wider product managers um, who work within the service are involved. So it's kind of exciting to people and certainly our operational staff. So the people who run our contact center, they are really excited about this because they've never seen anything as interesting. They've always wondered how customers react to the service. So it's really powerful for us to share that with them. It's, I guess it's probably taken some of what they had as kind of instincts. Like, you know, if you pass someone in the hallway, they might say, oh yeah, well, we always assume that the father's the bad guy in this, but actually getting some evidence for that and seeing how people feel about it must be really interesting. Yeah. I think, exactly. Just to check, just, Andrew, just on the point of working with, um, with DWP as a larger organization from the, from the sort of startups perspective, I think as well, it's busts some myths for us. So, you know, we work with a lot of large organizations and and actually we're finding, and bear in mind, like my background is is agency. So it's all very kind of Shoreditch, Nathan Barley, uh, the world that I come from. And it's really easy to think of these great hulking behemoth institutions that are slow moving, moving, full of people from the 1960s who haven't got a clue what they're doing. And actually the, uh, the reality couldn't be far further from the truth. The, the team that we're working with at DWP, the way that they work is every bit as agile as the most cutting edge agency. They know exactly what they're doing. They're hugely talented people who are um, doing really, really good work. And actually we found it really easy to work with them. It hasn't been difficult at all. Um, and, and that is increasingly becoming our, um, our experience with working with large organizations. I think this idea that large companies or large organizations are somehow stuck in the past is, is changing very rapidly. Yeah, I agree. I think that's really out of date now, isn't it? And certainly government over the last sort of five, ten years, it's been kind of really leading the way on some of this for how big organisations do it. So, yeah, that's really good feedback. I'm sure there's a few people listening to this who'd be really happy to hear that as well, who've been part of leading the charge on that. And um, I think we've only got time for one more question. So um, I was going to pick out Nick Betts is here and said, um, uh, great to see the uplift in shift to digital. Do you think there's more that could be done to integrate with HMRC to even further automate? Which is a little bit of a tricky one for Faye, I guess. But yeah, how no, could that absolutely. Work? So, like I say, there's we do do some integrations, obviously, um, as it stands. There is a lot more. There's a lot more that we can do to integrate with lots of data. So that's a huge part of our strategy going forward. So in terms of understanding the customer and its wider sense, DWP does have this thing, which is a kind of a central information system. And we're starting to look at, well, how does that work? Do we publish and subscribe information to this system? Do we pull data from different government departments? And actually for one of Lisa Payne services, the pension credit, for example, we knew that if somebody applied um, and they had um, power of attorney in place we used to have a really convoluted process of could you send us evidence of that and then actually by the time that's reached us that power of attorney could have changed so we started looking at um, the ministry of justice and getting access to that um, a database and an api feed where we could just look their name up and then it would give us a yep great that's exactly as it is and so those types of apis and integrations within our service just mean that we can massively slash applications down we can Prove data sets and yeah that, that's the massive thing that's ongoing with us so we're always exploring instead of asking a customer to give us evidence or provide information where else could we get it from first that's always our strategy now brilliant well i think we should wrap up at that there's a final question from tia who's saying do you have a summary blog or a medium post that uh, you could share on this so does either of you have something like that or i guess you could follow up with tia afterwards 
Yeah, we could, yeah. So I think one of the things we are, um, well, we're talking to Twitter, or we not, Pete Dakin, who are potentially going to write a blog about this work, which would be really exciting. Um, we also are going to, well, I'm definitely going to write my own. Um, so yes, here, yeah, watch this space. There'll be something out there soon. Very good. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for talking about it this afternoon. It's been really nice to see lots of positive feedback about it in the chat as well. So I think it's just such a good example of a local business dealing with kind of a, the bigger organisation that's on the patch. So, you know, really brilliant collaboration. So wish you every success with it. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye. 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 Bye.